I'm going to read a section from near the end of the book. The Hemingses have been at Monticello for almost 50 years, and the final catastrophe is upon them, as Jefferson dies $107,000 in debt in 1826. That's a lot of money. Um, the beginning of Jefferson Den started in June of 1826. The story of his final days was presented in the recollections of his white grandchildren, and their reflections illustrate the difference between the slave society that their mother and grandfather had been born into, and the one that the younger Randolphs knew. While the Jefferson family memories of Martha Jefferson's death in 1782 make no mention of the enslaved women who surely helped care for the dying woman, enslaved people played prominent roles in Jefferson's grandchildren's recorded <coughs> memories of his death. As Jefferson faded, his grandson Jeff Randolph and the others remembered that he would only have his servants sleeping near him. Randolph makes clear that more than one enslaved person was deeply involved with Jefferson's care in his final days. That is not surprising. There were more than enough Hemingses to stand watch, and in those intense moments, the intention of the entire place was riveted on the man who for over five decades had dominated the lives and imaginations of all the people who lived on the mountain. Randolph did not name all the servants who attended Jefferson, but it is almost certain that they included, at the very least, Burl Colbert and Sally Hemings, the only two people said to have taken care of his rooms and of him. As is often the case with those on their deathbeds, Jefferson had trouble sleeping, and people took turns sitting up with him during the day and at night. He did not want to be alone, and insisted that his enslaved caregivers make pallets so that they could sleep in the room with him overnight. Only they were allowed in his bedroom after dark and anxious members of the Randolph family took to making secret forays into his bedchamber to check on their own loved one. This is what it had come to. The people who had nursed him from the beginning of his life, whose energies he had harnessed for his own use up until this moment, were now called upon to care for him as he faced his last days on earth, sitting up with him at night, sleeping around his bed, to be ready to hear when he called out in need, in fear, or out of simple loneliness. These African Americans, whom he had sentimentalized as having the best hearts of any people in the world, had given their lives to him, followed him about, cleaned up after him, no doubt worried about him for his sake and their own, slept with him and borne him children, and he had held them as chattel, trying in the case of the Hemingses to soften a reality that could never be made soft. While he claimed to know and respect the quality of their hearts, he could never truly see them as human beings separate from, his, from him and his own needs, desires, and fears. In the end, all he really knew of their hearts was what they were willing to show him. And they carried enough knowledge in their heads to know his limitations and the perils of giving too much of themselves in the context of their society. The world they shared twisted and perverted practically everything it touched, made entirely human feelings and connections difficult suspect, and compromised. What could have been in the hearts of any human beings living under the power of that system was inevitably complicated, inevitably tragic. It is often said that Americans lack a sense both of tragedy and of irony. Von Brody very rightly called what happened on the mountain in 1826 and its immediate aftermath the Monticello tragedy. It was certainly that, but obviously much more. It was a national tragedy the natural result of America's engagement with the institution of slavery, the doctrine of white supremacy, and the nature of human frailty. The relationship of the Hemingses to the tragedy of slavery was unique only because they happened to be owned by one who made himself a public man, but wanted to keep private the world he really lived in with this particular African-American enslaved family. There's deep irony in this, too. What Jefferson accomplished for his children and some of their relatives was just what he said could not be accomplished in the nation as a whole. When freeing Burl Colbert, Joseph Fawcett, John Hemings, and Madison and Eston Hemings, the man who said he believed it impossible for blacks and whites to live together in the United States, and that people of African origin should be repatriated to another country, asked the legislature to allow these men to remain not just in America, but in Virginia. By the time Jefferson died, the American Colonization Society was up and running, and a few slave owners were freeing their slaves and making provision for their transportation to Liberia. They were acting on their deeply felt beliefs. 
What were Jefferson's likely true beliefs? The answer depend upon what, depends upon whether one chooses to pay more attention to what people say than what they actually do. Why not send the men he freed to Liberia? Jefferson gave the right answer to the question that likely never crossed his mind. The Hemingses should be allowed to remain in Virginia, he said, because that is where their families and connections were. That, of course, was the answer to the question why all other African Americans, most of whose ancestors who had, who had come to America before, around the time as the African woman who had born Elizabeth Hemings, should be allowed to remain in the United States. Many of these people were the children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren of white men, just like the men he freed. Their families and connections were in America, too. In truth, Jefferson did not mention race as the basis for the right to a home in America at all. Long-standing family ties and memories created the right. As was often the case, the public rhetorical Jefferson was very different from the down-to-personal business Jefferson, the one he seldom wanted anyone to see. The personal Jefferson had dominated the lives of the Hemingses. Their family connections to him, first through his wife and John Wales, and then the connections he created on his own with Sally Hemings, shaped the course of the family's existence. They also ensured that the world the Hemingses lived in with Jefferson would not be forgotten by their descendants and would remain a subject of fascination to the outside world. That is certainly not what Jefferson and, what his, and his white, white family wanted. But thankfully, they were not masters and mistresses across all space and time, and there was more to the world than law. The power of memory, love, and the strength of family kept alive the Hemingses' story. That we remember them today is the best and most fitting tribute to the no doubt terrified and unknown African who arrived on the shores of Virginia so many years ago to begin this family saga.